Welcome everybody, thank you for coming uh, on the beautiful morning. Um, I hope you'll find this talk provoking, engaging, not too depressing. Uh, at most of these talks I start by saying what I want you to do is argue me out of my position. So the more strongly you come back with a more, perhaps a more optimistic look at what's happening in the international human rights world, the happier I'll be. Um, I'd like to thank the Central European University and the School of Public Policy for inviting me, and particularly Dan, who wasn't only in my first International Politics of Human Rights class, he was also, uh, st and still remains, my best PhD student. So I'm extremely um, uh, happy to be invited back. It's a sort of nice full circle thing for him to invite me back to give a talk, uh, having endured my supervisions for many years uh, in London. What I'll do today is I'll try to talk only for about 40 minutes. In fact, it would be useful for me to see a timing device. Can you stick your watch there, Dan? That would be great. Um, I'll try to only talk for 40 minutes. I've given a version of this talk many times, and it normally provokes plenty of audience discussion, and that's normally the best bit, something a bit more interactive with the audience. So I'll be trying to wind it up after 40 minutes. Um, so here goes, uh, and uh, as I say, there'll be plenty of time for questions afterwards, so even though you might be bouncing in your seat a little bit, please try to hang on to those questions. Okay, I got this yesterday from the Global Centre for the Responsibility to Protect about what's happening in Burundi. I just want to highlight a couple of things here. Um, in this uh, statement that they released, uh, this will be familiar to any of you who work in the human rights world, you know, avoiding violence, demobilizing militias, um, and uh, recognizing the responsibility to protect. I want to ask a couple of questions at the outset about this. Who is the audience for this appeal? Okay, nobody in Burundi is going to take any notice of this appeal, and nobody in Burundi is going to be um, reading it. Uh, its ineffectualness is obvious. If there is no uh, violence after the um, coup, uh, in Burundi, then it won't be anything to do with the Global Centre's statement demanding that people don't commit violence. The coup was, of course, inspired by what were seen as deeply illegitimate actions on the part of the President trying to hang on to power and not leaving power, and has a significant amount of popular support, as you'll know from the protests in Burundi. Fourthly, often a strong state and a state that stands behind the rule of law is the thing that we need most in order to make human rights work. Fifthly, we assume R2P matters, and we assume international human rights law matters in these cases, but does it really? Is this an article of faith for Western-backed institutions? And that's really the sort of question I'm starting out with, uh, and I'll try to raise some, um, hopefully, um, uh, interesting points about this. My question is about the political effectiveness of human rights in the emerging world. Okay? It's not about the philosophical question of whether human rights exist. Some people say they do, some people say they don't. Given the scale of law we have around human rights, it seems perfectly reasonable to argue that they exist and uh, can be enforced, particularly at the national level where you have government standing behind rights. My argument really has two components to it. The first is just to tease out the implications of the structural change I think we're all seeing around us and trying to make sense of. We could call this the shift into a post-Western world, uh, and I'll outline in much more detail what I mean by that. But secondly, I think a world where we're going to see significantly more diversity. For me, the human rights story is a Western story anchored in Western ideas about um, uh, legitimate political institutions at the national and global level. And I think we're living through an era where Europe in particular is, is, is progressively weaker than it's been probably for 150 or 200 years. What difference will this make? That story is a secularizing story, for example. That story is a story in which developed societies become increasingly secular. The world to come is not a world in which religion is going to go away. In fact, it's a world in which religion is increasingly salient. Also a world in which the nationalist project, which, say, the EU was supposed to have, if you like, absorbed into a broader political home, that project is also invigorated in many ways, and Hungary is a good place to be giving this talk about the nationalist project and what implications that has for human rights. So those two big structural shifts. I'll, before that, I'll go through 10 issues, which I think are issues anyway for human rights, even if the West was still as strong as it had ever been, and it looked like we were on that secularizing trend um, to modernization. 
Politics, not law, I suggest, is where we're going to see the action in the next two, three, four decades. Um, that, and and this, this both means less emphasis on law at the international level, but also less effectiveness for that law when we get beneath that international level to the local and national level. And this leads to the next point, which is a tension within the global human rights movement. I don't think there is a global human rights movement. I think all, all the issues you see within global politics about inequality of resources, priorities, are things replicated within the global human rights movement. For me, it's a, a sort of ideological banner for advocates for global human rights to claim we're all part of one movement. Whereas if you look at the contestation within that movement, it, to what extent does it make sense to say there's one movement here? Okay? I know that Ari Naya has published his book on the international human rights movement, but I think it makes just as much sense to say that there's so much diversity within that movement that these people are not all parts of the same movement. And that leads me to make a distinction I make in the book between capital H, capital R, human rights, which is the global legal and organizational architecture, the ICC, R2P, the conventions, the Human Rights Council, Universal Periodic Review, all focused on states, and a whole variety of diverse forms of local activism, which might use the language of rights, but might use religious language, it might use the language of justice, uh, economic justice, fairness, it may use all sorts of other ideas in order to argue for social change at the local level. And I think there are tensions there um, to get at. So I'll conclude by suggesting that the world to come will be one in which global human rights will not be globalized. This is the assumption we have which we just carry with us, that the project is ever wider in its reach and ever deeper embedded. But what if that's not the case? What if what we have are zones where human rights are observed and zones where human rights are less observed? Okay, so that's the basic outline, the basic picture. First of all, and I'll go through this quickly, but I don't mean to disparage it, and one of the things I've really been critiqued for about the book is that I don't spend any time saying these are the things that international human rights have achieved. And part of the reason I don't do that is because there's an enormous number of books doing this. And if I asked you to count the number of people who are broadly sort of sympathetic and engaged with the human rights world but from a very critical perspective. You'd come up with Philip Alston, for example, as somebody within the human rights world who's quite critical. But beyond the edges of that, there's me, Samuel Moyne, there's um, uh, Eric Posner, um, you know, there's a Kirsten Sellers, there's a limited number of critics compared with the huge amount of material that's published about the human rights uh, success story in a more conventional way. Alison Brisk, I see, is coming to speak to you in, in three or four weeks' time, and her speaking rights to power is an example of, a, of another book which argues for the success of rights. So I'm trying to do something which pushes back a little bit against that, but nevertheless I will say something about human rights achievements. As you can see here, since the 1970s, particularly in terms of laws and conventions, I think there are ten or more treaty bodies now associated with human rights conventions, we have uh, opinion polls um, arguing that there's broad public support for human rights globally. These are taken in many countries. Exactly what support for human rights means is more opaque, but nevertheless people have a rhetorical commitment to human rights. Human rights are embedded in the international system, a little bit more particularly in the UN. Of course that came in response to the failure of human rights in Sri Lanka, and any of you who read the Charles Petrie report will be shocked by the degree to which UN workers didn't think human rights were their responsibility. So rights up front is Ban Ki-moon's attempt to try to um, uh, accommodate that. And I've just highlighted there the UN's report on North Korea from last year, where on the first page we talk about the ICC, R2P, Crimes Against Humanity and Human Rights. Okay, the sort of, the, everything is there on the first page about North Korea, which is perhaps the worst case of a human rights abuser. These, are, these are organizations are also expanding. So you have the ICC looking to examine Israel's activities in Gaza last year. You have potential examinations of, these are pre-investigation, these are just examination stage, uh, 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 American troops in Afghanistan and UK troops in Iraq and whether or not they've committed war crimes. You have a Convention on Crimes Against Humanity which is being um, put together in the International Law Commission at the moment. You have Tunisia proposing an international constitutional court, a Swiss proposal for a world court of human rights, so the ICC isn't enough, 
another level above that. You have a push into the um, idea of regulating business through human rights and some sort of vague suggestions there might even be a convention on business and human rights. These are all trying to gl close the gap, the legal gaps, the legal holes, and create one world of kind of global constitutional law, and human rights law is its name. So, this is self-explanatory. Human rights are well-funded, they're central to the rhetoric and actions of many powerful states. They're no longer marginal. In the 1970s, they were barely mentioned. Now, you wouldn't hear a newscast or read a newspaper without human rights being mentioned on numerous occasions in relation to most sort of front page stories. This is the global human rights regime. Okay, now these are 10 questions I want to raise which I think are questions anyway, even if things were more or less going on as before. The first is the question of impact. Okay? We have a lot of human rights law. How much compliance with that law do we have? Most political science focuses on whether states agree to international law. It doesn't go the step further and say, do states actually try to realize, operationalize their commitments under, for example, a convention on the elimination of discrimination against women? It, doesn't, it takes five minutes to see that that doesn't happen even in societies which are supposed to be rights observing. So that's the first question. Do we need more focus on whether states actually observe their commitments, their obligations under human rights? And that does raise a difficult question about how we understand compliance, about which there's some interesting uh, uh, legal um, conversation. Secondly, hard cases. Okay? Most even positive accounts accept that human rights work best where they're least needed. Unsurprisingly, the Western European record on human rights not unblemished at all and in being rolled back potentially in some areas, but nevertheless is better than Uzbekistan's um, record on human rights. So we can push for more human rights observance in Western Europe, but once we get into the tougher cases, some of the mechanisms which are perceived to work in the easier cases where there's already a democracy and where there's already some public commitment to the idea of rights, may well be less and less effective. In other words, we may have done the easy bit and the hard bit may be to come. And this is particularly, for example, in relation to areas where religion is still a deeply important um, uh, 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 social and political force. Thirdly, the scale of pushback. There are numerous cases where this pushback against human rights, and I'll mention a few a little bit later on, where, if you like, states are innovating. Okay, you change the tax laws, you cut off foreign funding, you make it just harder to do human rights work. You don't necessarily have to lock up human rights activists, you can just make it very difficult for them to work. So we come out with a whole series of human rights pushback, Uzbekistan, Egypt, Thailand, Iran, uh, uh, Uganda, and the anti-homosexuality legislation, which I know has been parked for a while, but uh, that sort of homophobic legislation appears to be spreading uh, in other parts of Africa. So some pushback. Um, and above that all, of course, you have China and Russia. And this is one of the big takeaway points I want to stress. If China were to be a potential uh, competitor for the United States politically at the international level, then it provides a degree of legitimacy for people who put state sovereignty and the nationalist project ahead of human rights. You don't just have to list to Washington anymore, you can go to Beijing. And Beijing will say, okay, if you don't want to do this stuff, you don't have to do this stuff. We're not really interested in global human rights. Fourthly, hypocrisy and double standards. Um, we can see many examples of this. I've highlighted a couple there. The, the um, uh, uh, UK and US foreign policy in relation to NATO and Afghanistan, for example, also in Libya. The UK's Conservative government is now going to try to pull out of the Human Rights Act because it's unhappy with the way the European Court of Human Rights actually works in the way it's supposed to work, which is constrain national governments from abusing people's human rights. Uh, and I mentioned also President Obama's adept use of lawfare there, particularly in relation, relation to Guantanamo, drones and, and other um, cases. So Western governments that talk the language of human rights but actually find subtle ways, and in the UK case not so subtle, not to observe human rights commitments. Fifthly, the degree to which human rights has been politicised in some places. In other words, even if we could talk a progressive language, human rights might not necessarily be it. 
In many societies, human rights are seen as irredeemably political. In India, for example, they're seen as political, and therefore that sort of neutral, impartial vision of human rights really just doesn't work, particularly where human rights groups are attacking the government. In relation to um, uh, Russia, it's another example there, the, the use of the sort of embedding of human rights within that traditional values legislation and the idea that you can reach human rights through traditional values. So reorienting the idea of rights such that it actually bolsters the existing regime rather than provides a challenge to it. Um, and, uh, and another aspect of this is rights are exported into areas like climate change. Will they become so vague and nebulous that they'll lose their really powerful moral core because they appear to apply to everything? Um, and there appears to be no way to draw boundaries around them and say these are the core rights. And you'll know that human rights advocates will push back hard against any attempt to prioritise rights. Because in the traditional way of doing this, civil and political rights come out above economic and social rights. And as we'll see later on, that's a deeply problematic outcome. I'll go quickly through these. Even countries that are democratic, like Brazil, are unhappy about the degree to which they're excluded from discussions around things like the responsibility to protect. Human rights have a political and moral economy internally, where there are disparities of wealth and um, agenda-setting influence at the international level. I've already sort of mentioned that. Also, maybe there's going to be increasing competition from other forms of mobilisation. And the one that I mentioned there is Pope Francis and the Roman Catholic Church. If Pope Francis can effectively sideline issues about uh, sexual abuse, women's rights and LGBT rights and focus on poverty, then it's not obvious that if you're an anti-poverty campaigner it might not be worth throwing in your lot with the Roman Catholic Church because in the notion there are more than a billion members of the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope is an extremely influential figurehead for that. So potentially more competition. Again, I'm trying to take us away from the assumption that human rights have that secular dynamic underlying them. Uh, the ninth point is demographics and technology. Do young people join human rights organisations for life? When, you know, when I talk to this audience, uh, I, are there any Amnesty International members here? There aren't any. In, 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 the camera can't see, so I'll say, oh, there's hundreds in there, hundreds in there. Um, when, 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 you, when you give this talk in, in Britain, for example, quite a lot of people put up their hand, many of them will have been members of Amnesty for 30 or 40 years. Once you join Amnesty, you really don't stop being a member in the 70s and 80s. You write your letters, you go to your groups. Young people don't join organisations in this way anymore. They join for particular issues, they join potentially a, a network of people working in different places on the same issue, and they don't like hierarchically driven organisations. They want much more a peer-to-peer -peer, um, setup. This presents a challenge for many bigger human rights membership organisations and humanitarian and relief and development organisations too, who want you to join and pay your money but really not have a voice particularly. Just keep doing the things that they want you to do for year after year. And so they're spending more money on trying to replace leaving members with new members than they've had to before. Uh, this also drives the interest in celebrity, for example, and in, in high-impact global campaigns to try to keep young people interested. I normally make a joke at this point, which I suppose I will make even though it's on camera, which is, you know, and I've written about this on the um, Open Transformations website, how committed are people who, are, who see something come up, sign an avowed petition on this, and then they go back to Game of Thrones or whatever it is? These, they, are, these act, are these the activists of the future? Okay. How do we know that those 40 million people are really a political constituency that are going to make a difference somewhere? I suggest that a degree of scepticism at this stage is in order about this. And the final point is tensions within that human rights world. The critique of the surveillance states, the UK and the US of course prominent in this after um, uh, Edward Snowden, WikiLeaks and Chelsea Manning, but also you see the bill that the French uh, um, uh, government are, um, are, are um, proposing. This, this will curb civil liberties and open up a huge space for surveillance. But this is not done against the will of the population. Lots and lots of people support this surveillance structure. And this leads to another key take-home point I want to stress. We assume, the human rights movement assumes, that the people committed to the idea of human rights are committed to them on the basis that everybody has them and they should be recognised in equal measure. 
So the, think of the worst murderer or tor torturer you can. Think of the, uh, the, the uh, ISIS fighters beheading people. Uh, think of President Assad in Syria. Human rights advocates, if they were to be arrested, should be campaigning for their human rights. Okay? They should be subject to the due process of law. They should be treated as human beings. I suggest that's not how large numbers of people really think about human rights. That they think about human rights as being for people who are not guilty of deeply antisocial crimes or antisocial behaviour. In other words, you have to have some commitment to the community in order to be treated as having a right to your full human rights. Okay? I'm not, you, you, I welcome you to come back on me, at me about this in the Q&A, but that's what I suggest. Okay, that, in fact, people make clear distinctions, which is why, for example, in countries like the United States, you get many people who would support human rights who are in favour of the death penalty. Okay? When they're against the death penalty, they mean the death penalty for Nelson Mandela. Okay? They don't mean the death penalty for a serial murderer and rapist. Okay? They, they see that as somebody who, in a sense, has abdicated their human rights. Now, we know that... You, you, being human is the only qualification for having your human rights as far as the um, ideology of human rights is concerned. So I think there's a core tension there too. Okay, everybody's probably suitably sort of softened up and depressed now. As if this wasn't enough, in a sense, the point I want to make now is and the high watermark for human rights has passed. That high watermark is the 1990s and into the 2000s. This was a, an era of Western confidence, US hegemony after the end of the Cold War. So you got the ad hoc tribunals, you got the International Criminal Court, you got the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and there was a real momentum built up about the future of human rights. This stumbled on after 9-11, but slowly I think it's unraveled 9-11 is part of that, but also these bigger structural changes, I think, are part of that. The first big structural change is multipolarity, not hegemony. The US-dominated system is eroding. Now, the West, I see as something which the US and the Europeans have been, uh, in a sense, allied about, and much of this project for the last 40, 50, 60 years, but I think that's coming apart. Okay, I'm sceptical the US has a deep interest in Europe, except economically, and as we know, there's a strategic, an attempt to strategically refocus on Asia and the Pacific by the United States. This is where the people are, this is where the trade and economic development is, this is where some of the major security issues of the future are going to be, and US foreign policy is heavily based around this idea of containing China and building up alliances, for example, through the, uh, um, the Pacific Trade Treaty in order to try to cement countries like Vietnam in that sort of Western um, uh, American bloc. In other words, the US is refocusing away from Europe. I know that Russia and the Middle East keeps trying to pull the US its focus back into the margins of Europe, but it has tried to strategically refocus. Europe, and I don't the EU could disintegrate, which would undermine Europe's political influence significantly, but even without that, I think European influence at the international level is waning. And there are various studies that have looked at voting patterns in the United Nations and elsewhere and shown that countries are far less likely to follow the European lead and much more interested in what the Chinese position will be on many questions. China is an alternative source for funding and an alternative source for diplomatic leverage. It's also the case, of course, that the Europeans are assuming more responsibility for some of the major institutions of the international human rights realm. So, for example, the International Criminal Court is being um, majority funded now by the Europeans, and the Europeans are also behind most of the progressive legislation that goes through the Human Rights Council. My question is, is anybody really listening to Europe anymore? If you had to bank on the future focus of international political life, I don't think it would be The Hague and Geneva. Alongside this, we have a ri the rise and a whole series of, of countries emerging from the South. These countries, many of them, are not going to... The United States is still going to be first among equals for certainly my lifetime and the lifetime maybe of some of the younger people within the room. But it's going to be much closer in terms of political leverage 
and maybe in relation to China economic leverage than, uh, some of the, uh, than it has been for the last few decades. So a world where China is almost as influential politically as the United States, but where you have Russia, Indonesia, Mexico, Brazil, India, Nigeria, South Africa, it's a much more complex world. These aren't countries which are communist, these aren't countries with strong communist, internal communist movements, they are in one way or another on the transition towards democracy, so they are going in the direction that they're supposed to be going in as far as uh, American foreign policy is concerned, but they're not necessarily going to play ball and, uh, around issues of international justice and human rights. Okay. A good example of that, which I think I have on a later slide, but it occurs to me to bring it up now, is something like the executions in Indonesia. The, the, the material I read about this suggested there's huge public support for those executions, 86%. This PowerPoint I can make available, and it has some sources on the end. 86% in one of the reports I read support the death penalty for drug traffickers. So there's a real issue there. Indonesia isn't necessarily an outlaw international state, but it is a state which wants to hang on to the death penalty, and there seems to be a lot of popular support for that. So, so the, and this country is going to be difficult to influence. If you look at some of the um, discussion around the death penalty, that, that support for the death penalty went up as countries externally criticized Indonesia. Like, it's up to us, okay? Why can't we have the death penalty? You don't have to do it, why can't we have it? Um, Russian and Chinese vetoes in Syria. So the major sort of humanitarian intervention question uh, of the last three or four years, and that's been completely blocked by classic Cold War politics. You'll know there's a human rights move to try to eliminate, to try to convince the permanent five Security Council members not to use their veto on matters of international, vital international concern. Let's talk about that in q and I think it's hopeless to think that that would ever happen, or the P5 would ever not use their veto over and if they're not going to use it over Syria, you know, when will they, when will they refrain from using it? Except when their important interests aren't at stake. So, a world in which there's just far more powers, and a world, therefore, where the United States is forced to think as much about alliances and its, its allies in the region as it is about human rights. Is it going to put Vietnam under intolerable pressure about human rights when it wants Vietnam in the Pacific Trade Treaty as a bulwark against Chinese influence? Some of you may have seen Obama meeting um, Gulf leaders in the United States uh, at the moment, and recently he met a series of other leaders, including uh, from the Egyptian government in Washington. You know, and various uh, human rights uh, organizations were pointing out, obviously, these are the people you're supposed to be opposing in terms of their human rights abuses, not trying to build alliances with them in order to manage international political events. So if the US is focused on its alliance structure, it's uh, spreading the burden to other countries and containing China, and Europe isn't powerful enough, what will happen to those global human rights institutions? Okay. And to sort of bring this together, if you look at Freedom House's most recent report, it charts eight consecutive years of decline in uh, civil and political rights. And it argues, in fact, that what's happened in the 2000s is that from a period in, around 9-11 and sort of before and afterwards, when authoritarian countries were forced to have a cosmetic appearance of democratizing and caring about human rights, that in fact it's pretty... Uh, uh, easy now to get away with some completely authoritarian policies without much international condemnation. In other words, as they say, this is the twilight of that sort of cosmetic authoritarianism and a return to full authoritarianism. I mentioned China briefly. I'm conscious of the time, so I'm, you can, I'll make these slides available. You can look at them. I'm really making the point there that there are some areas where China, there are some languages that China might speak. This is in relation to North Korea when China resist, rejected the UN report. China might speak a language like the efficient administration of justice, for example, but the human rights language is toxic within China. And if we think China will be broadly as politically influential in, say, 20 years as the United States, and it won't speak the language of human rights, then an alternative language is going to have to be found. Okay, and I just mentioned here, this is another one, examples of the more subtle ways in which you can also cut off support for human rights just by choking off funding. Okay. 
The second shift is towards sort of religion, nationalism, and uh, traditional values. These will, oh, the picture I'm simply trying to draw here is one where we don't assume that human rights and justice norms will be globalized. We assume there will be significant diversity. So there will be death penalty countries and non-death penalty countries. There will be ICC members and non-ICC members. The assumption, remember I land at the beginning, is really that everybody's heading towards a world in effect where everybody's an ICC member and everybody gets rid of the death penalty and everybody observes their obligations under international human rights law. And even if that, there appears to be reverses, and trust me, I, I, I retweet Human Rights Watch tweets more than any other tweet. It's not that I, I see the awful violations and abuses that many countries are committing in all sorts of ways. But my position is that this is just often wailing into the darkness, that there's no real prospect of an extension of this regime. And really what should happen is a, a, an attempt to double down on what already exists and try to make that function and embed that better, not expand it further. So, so what we have here is an, a pragmatic acceptance that human rights have gone as far as they're likely to go, certain for the, certainly for the foreseeable future. The secularism story is not going to mark the rest of the world. This is a European story. I know some of the recent evidence has suggested that at last the United States is beginning to secularize, as the sociologist Max Weber would have predicted. But Europe is the secularized continent. Nowhere else is noticeably secularized. So religion are going to be a central part of this. And religious organizations have strong, morally grounded belief in things like gender, sexuality, children, attitudes to your uh, superiors and attitudes to social authority, these are things which can't be assumed to be going to disappear. Um, I may, I'll just mention a couple of these other things. Or you can see them down there, the, the importance of the United States in terms of, for example, getting an investigation into Sri Lanka, getting that resolution passed, in terms of defeating the anti-blasphemy law that was proposed in the Human Rights Council. Um, so a whole set, and we'll talk more in Q&A potentially about this. You'll be able to come up with many examples of diversity. The thing I want to stress here, my sort of take home, as they say here, is that this, this resistance is not necessarily, as it were, classic, principled, Putin-style resistance to the whole idea of human rights. It's often from people who live in societies with much more complex and extended family structures where the idea of children's rights, for example, doesn't really make very much sense. Children have obligations and responsibilities to their parents and grandparents. But these are often well-ordered, well-organized societies, and these are deeply held social norms. What happens there? Okay, do we just say, okay, you, we're not going to push the human rights project in this area, um, but of course that is something that the global human rights movement, if it exists, is unable to do, to prioritize rights, to say we'll tolerate certain forms of gender discrimination here and certain forms of sexuality discrimination there. But you're not opposing dictators. You're opposing deeply held social and cultural values. And that, that is a, it's a conceit on the part of, as it were, sort of Western modernizers that eventually everybody will come to see that a Western secular lifestyle is preferable. And I think that that project is not going to go very much further. And the resistance that we see is an example of that. Okay, and there's just some information, there's a, a Pew uh, research on uh, religion and public life project which shows just how salient religion is in numerous countries worldwide. Okay, what's to be done? Okay, so I'm approaching the end now, another five or so minutes. Violence is declining. If any of you read Stephen Pinker's book, Better Angels of Our Nature, he says don't worry, war is a thing of the past. Awful forms of torture have been mitigated. There's far less violence around. And really, you have far less chance of dying violently now than you probably have done at any point in history. This is no consolation if you're in Syria or um, Congo or other places. But he has a wealth of statistical material which um, seems to bolster this story. He doesn't make predictions about the future. It could all be about to go very badly wrong. But this is his argument. So maybe one answer is read that, take that, those statistics on board, and believe that the future is getting better. So I'm just completely wrong, and that may well turn out to be the case, and I'm sure we all at some level hope so. A second response is American leadership. 
we're just about to see a parade of Republican and Democratic candidates, or I'm not sure how many Democratic candidates there will be, um, and everyone will talk about renewing and reinvigorating American leadership except the very um, uh, libertarian Republican candidates who want to sort of withdraw from the world. Is American leadership the answer? Can the United States lead in the way it's assumed to have been leading for the last, uh, well, since the Second World War? Uh, I'm skeptical about this, whether there's the will, whether there's the money, whether there's the political leverage to do so, but again, that's some, that might be an answer to the uh, scenario I've outlined. Next, maybe more subtle forms of paternalism. Okay? If, you look at the way, if you look at the groups that have been successful, for example, in dealing with female genital cutting in Africa, they've actually adopted very subtle strategies of really engaging at a deep level with local communities. The one I, I know something about is called Tostan in Senegal, and they've been very effective at talking to local people, not with a heavy human rights language, but in a what are your values about your children kind of language and negotiating a way forward which does nevertheless bring in human rights principles but also allows local people to feel ownership of the process. So maybe more effective human rights work is going to be less global con condemnation and much more a focus on local activism and supporting local activists using any form of language or, or uh, political action that they want to. A next stage might be middle class consciousness raising in the South. Okay? Much historical research, historical sociological research suggests that democracy tends to come where you get an expanding middle class and you get an expanding middle class where you get rising per capita incomes. In other words, newly wealthy people want to hold the state to account and now have some leverage to do it. This is the classic modernization picture. So maybe there's some hope here in the middle class in India, the middle class in China, in Brazil, in Indonesia. So maybe that's where the focus should be. The issue there, of course, is that that may not be very good for many economic and social rights. Okay? Because economic redistribution and economic justice may not be a priority for that increasingly affluent middle class. But that may lead to change within some of the countries, particularly China, which are at the moment perceived to be reluctant to embrace the human rights frame. Maybe an alternative language, I'm going to say something a little bit about that in a moment. Maybe more strategic alliances with religious actors, whether it's with um, liberal Islam, whether it's with the, the more progressive wing of the Catholic Church, whether it's you know, with other religious movements and organizations. Now I think this presents a challenge for many within the human rights world and within the development world um, because it means taking religion seriously. And this, of course, potentially presents limits to the rights that you can pursue. Because if poverty is what you're talking about, you'll get a lot of buy-in from the Catholic Church, as I suggested earlier, but you won't necessarily get the same buy-in about LGBT rights. And finally, well, actually, the final point is, is the point, really, that I've been making from the outset, which is why do we expect human rights to be globalized? OK. So I think, so the last three slides, I'll go through them relatively quickly. Neo-Westphalia, those of you who've done any international relations, and I don't know whether international lawyers do it in this way too, but the idea was the modern state system was formed in 1648 in two treaties um, uh, in ending the uh, Thirty Years' War in Europe. Um, lots of historical contestation about that, dating if you're interested, but Neo-Westphalia. In other words, a world which is more about interstate reactions and less about top-down law that um, makes the way in which uh, states govern their own societies conditional upon their human rights and justice observance. So you will get cooperation in areas which Russia, China, the United States, the EU, I think are important. Trade, uh, uh, transport, terrorism, International terrorism is, cooperation is good for authoritarian and non-authoritarian states because it enables them to increase their power at the expense of their own populations. Public health maybe, climate change, energy, you'll get some cooperation. But you won't get this around top-down human rights law and international justice law. Um, because what you don't have anymore is a sort of consensus or the political power at that central level to make this a condition of what constitutes good government and good governance. Okay. So a neo-Westphalian world is one where questions about uh, 
who gets human rights and who doesn't will be subject to a kind of structural inequality. Nothing could better exemplify this than all these poor people stuck on boats in Asia and the Mediterranean, desperately trying to get into areas where they think that there'll be jobs for them and employment for them and so they can remit money back home. That structural inequality, I suggest, will be the mark of the future, not a globalised world. Two more slides. Okay. There's a, the citation for this is at the end of the PowerPoint. There was a report produced called World Protest 2006 to 2013, looking through internet sources at all the um, uh, at what what the main messages were coming out of the Occupy movements and other street protests. And overwhelmingly, these were about economic justice. The language of human rights was used in some cases, but in the majority of cases, it was not. Okay. In other words, one suggestion is the language of human rights might have to give way to the language of economic justice. Now, when you think about the international, so much focus goes on the international criminal justice regime and, relatively speaking, so little focus on social and economic <coughs> rights and social justice. So a new normative framework might be the one outlined in the UNDP report from 2013, the rise of the South, human progress in a diverse world. There's a couple of nice quotations there that encapsulate aspects of this changing world. But I'll draw your attention. I did this as a rough survey, so I, I hope it's accurate. I'm pretty sure it is. Um, I could find human rights mentioned 14 times, but equity mentioned more than 40 times. In other words, more of a bargain, more of a negotiation. Inequality and economic justice, what multinational corporations are doing, why the um, rich world is perceived to exploit the poor world. Um, these questions are going to have to be part of the human rights conversation, and they're not a conversation that fit particularly well with an emphasis on civil and political rights, which I would suggest hitherto has dominated international human rights. Uh, attention and campaigning. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>